Okay, now before I work these additional examples, I want to, to uh, I want to encourage you to strongly to stop and try them yourself. The only way you're going to really succeed in this class is if you practice the problems. And you, the only time you're going to get to practice is here and on the homework. So if we were in, in class, like a normal class, I would be stopping and making the whole class work these problems in class. Uh, and so you, uh, you need to try and do that yourself right here. So work these problems, stop the video, work these problems, see what you did. Don't start and check, just work it through and see if you get it right. Then come back and watch the solutions if you're still confused but don't use the video solutions as a crutch because you won't be able to do so on the tests, okay? Now, once you've tried them on your own, come back and, uh, and see what you've got, okay? And we'll start with the first question here. How much do you need to invest to have $10,000 in five years earning 12%, okay? Now here, I haven't laid out what kind of problem this is, so this is your first practice attempt at determining what the problem's asking for, then picking all the right information out of the problem to use uh, to solve. So it says, uh, the first thing we need to do is determine what kind of problem this is. And it says, how much do we need to invest to have $10,000 in five years? Right. So we can sort of mentally expand this problem and add some words in here and say, how much do you need to invest today in order to have $10,000 five years from now? And hopefully that makes it clear that this is a present value problem. We want to know what do we need to invest now, today, present, in order to have $10,000 in five years. And we're going to earn 12% per year uh, in this account. So we're trying to solve for the present value here. And we're going to use a calculator now. So we're going to write down all of our missing variables. Remember the present value formula is the future value divided by one plus the interest rate or the rate that we earn raised to the number of periods. And so those are the three buttons that we need to, uh, or the three values that we need to fill. We need to fill future value, the rate, which on the calculator is IY, and in, which is still the number of periods. And we wanna calculate the present value. We wanna solve for present value there. So uh, our interest rate is usually where we start because that's usually where we're gonna discover what the compounding period is. So here we don't have any other information. And again, I'm, I'm a little loose with the problems that I work in class because I'm here to explain it. Uh, if for instance, this was an exam or homework question, it would be very clear and say, 12% per year compounded annually. Okay. Here we don't, so we just, we're just, I'm gonna tell you to assume that it's 12% per year. So that's our compounding period, 12% per year. Our in is the number of periods, and because our compounding period is the year, we can stick with what's given, which is five years. And our future value is the amount that we want at the end of our investment, which is $10,000. Okay. And that's all the information we need. Now, we can see here, uh, and something that I want to make note and encourage you to do, is that I, I would encourage you to uh, write down your periods and until you're very comfortable with doing the work on these kinds of problems and with understanding what everything goes and how the compounding periods work with each other, I would encourage you to write 12% per year or 2% per month. And then that will hopefully trigger you to remember that your in is not an annual amount. It is a, um, your in is a number of periods. So if you have years written down, then hopefully that will trigger you to remember to have e years as your period. And if we had to convert this to months, then hopefully that would trigger you to convert this also to months. Right. Now, ultimately, you'll get good enough at these problems uh, that you won't need to be keep writing these down. But I would encourage you in the beginning to write them down just to make sure that you're uh, building the right habits okay, when you're practicing. Okay, now let's take a look at the calculator solution. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things here uh, for the calculator that we need to remember. Uh, and uh, or, or that we need to think about. 
Uh, the first is that it's always helpful to have uh, four digits displayed when you're running these calculations. Uh, I'm always going to use four digits and then round down to two. Uh, so if you are also using four digits, uh, you won't have any rounding errors differently than me as long as you're doing the same steps as me. The way to convert the number of decimals you have uh, is to press the second button and then the format button, which is just above the period. So second and then the period button. You'll see decimal equals two if you have a brand new calculator. Simply change that to four and then set that value by pressing the enter button up at the top. Now you'll see four with four decimals behind it and you can clear out. If you have uh, borrowed a calculator or bought an old calculator, I would encourage you to uh, perhaps uh, do that again or reset your calculator just in case there's anything going on. And you can reset the calculator by pressing second and then reset and then enter and that'll reset the calculator. Okay. Uh, and if you're ever having issues, I would encourage that to be a step. It, it's not gonna change anything. The only thing that you'll see differently is, for instance, now my decimals are set back to two digits, so I have to bring my four decimals back. And now I'm ready to go. Okay. Now, the time value money problems are all gonna be solved using these five gray buttons across the top here. N, I, Y, P, V, P, M, T, and future value, F, V. So future value, payment, present value, interest per period, number of periods. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked about the payment yet, so we'll ignore it for now, but these other four are what we're looking for. Right. Now, the most important thing to remember about using this calculator in particular, and again, this doesn't go for the graphing calculators. If you have a graphing calculator, remember, uh, that's not something I'll be teaching specifically, but there are instructions, along with instructions for this calculator, on the As You Learn page, all the way at the bottom under the Calculator Help tab. There's also lots of YouTube videos. So um, those of you that are using the graphing calculator, it's gonna to be totally different, but the, uh, the, the, the system is the same. It's just gonna be a different way that you enter in and get to the values. Okay. So the most important thing to, be, to remember about using this calculator is that it stores values in the finance functions in a different place than it would say store a calculation like this, two times five equals 10. We all know that to get rid of this, we just press the clear button. If we have values entered into the financial calculation, the financial functions up here, the clear button does not clear those values. We have to clear those separately and there's gonna be a bunch of different clears here for different financial functions. But for this row, the time value of money functions, the way we clear the value stored here is by pressing second and then above the future value button, it says clear TVM, clear time value of money. So we press second and future value and that clears our values. Now this should be your standard operating procedure. Anytime you start a, a time value money problem, anytime you start to use the calculator, you gotta clear out the old values because it's really easy to forget about something in here and, uh, and then we don't, uh, we don't have it going forward. Uh, and it's really easy to say, have a payment in one problem, not have a payment in another problem, but recalculate because this is stored, we calculate our answer and we get something totally wonky but you enter it in anyway because you think the calculator doesn't lie to you, right? And the calculator doesn't lie. It just works with exactly what it has. So we have to make sure that we don't mess up our inputs on the calculator. And you're gonna get very proficient at using this and so checking your work and doing the problem a second time is gonna ultimately not be that uh, big of a time waste for you as long as you've done enough practice to get good, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna enter in our values here. Uh, the way to enter in the values on this calculator is to first enter in the value, and there's no order that you need to follow. But for instance, if we wanna enter in our number of periods, we're gonna have five annual periods. So first put the number, then press the button. So I'm gonna press five and then in. And then you'll see when it's set, it's gonna jump out and say in equals 5.0000. Yeah. I don't have to do anything here. I can just simply enter the next number by pressing the next button. So I'll say future value is $10,000. So I enter 10,000 and press FV. Now, even if I press clear here, those values are stored, right? The way to clear those values is to press second and future value to clear the time value money buttons, okay? So those values are still stored. And the last thing I'll enter here is the interest rate. Now, what you have to remember for the calculator is that 
differently in the calculator from the formula. The calculator wants you to enter in the rate as a whole percentage, so as a whole number. So don't enter 0.12, enter 12, and when you set this value, the calculator automatically considers it as a percentage. Okay? So the calculator wants whole percentage values uh, in the rate function. Now we have our three values entered, and the way we solve for the present value is we press the compute button up here in the top left, compute, and then we press whatever we're trying to solve for. So in this case, present value. And we see that we get negative 5,674,2686. So we say present value is negative 5,674.2686. Now, this uh, might look a little unusual to you, and it's uh, just a weird quirk of the way that calculators and computers, for instance, Excel, have chosen to implement the time value of money in their system. And that implementation has been to think about these kinds of problems in terms of how they are actually transacted, in terms of accounting, right? And so the way that this actually is transacted, if we think about it in accounting terminology, is that to make this investment, I need to spend, I need to have an outlay of 5,674, and then I'm gonna leave it in the account for five years, earning 12%, and I have a, a resulting inflow of cash of $10,000, right? So in other words, the the important distinctions here are the cash leaving the uh, a, a hypothetical account, like savings account, and the cash coming back in, what we'll call cash inflows and cash outflows. So we need to be aware of that because the calculator requires these as inputs. Now, typically your cash outflows are going to be the present value amounts because the problems are usually talking about what do you need to invest now in order to receive a certain amount in the future, right? So anytime that you are investing money or spending money, anytime that you are um, having money be put somewhere else, so you're buying a car or you're making an investment or you're saving for a college fund or you're saving for retirement or you're buying a house, all of those things are cash outflows. And so those are negative inputs into the calculator. Now, typically, again, those are your present value amounts, but not always. Now, anytime that you are receiving money or you're receiving the proceeds of a money uh, of, of an investment account or you're selling something or you are retiring and, and drawing down your amount, your money, this is a cash inflow. This is money coming back to you. Right? And that is always going to be input as a positive amount. So that's why we enter our future value here as a positive amount. Now, if this problem was flipped and the problem said, how, do we, uh, how, much, do, uh, how much are we going to get if I invest 5,674 for five years at 12%, we would actually input our present value here as a negative because we would say that's a cash outflow. So we're gonna enter it as a negative and our answer would be a positive, okay? Now, this is a necessary thing. You have to do this one way or the other and particularly when we get to the more complicated problems that are using, um, that are using payments, uh, this becomes a, a, a crucial, uh, crucially important uh, piece of the puzzle.